Hello and welcome to Right Hearted with me, Stuart Wakefield. I am very, very honoured to have these two guests with me today. It's the first time I've had two guests uh, and we have historical fiction writers. Um, so I would like to introduce and welcome, we have Suzanne Dunlap, who is an author and book coach, and Margaret McNellis, who is an author, a book coach and a witch. Both of you, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you for Thank having. You. Yeah, it's brilliant. Thank you for coming along. So um, I always ask the question of everybody, um, how did you start writing? So uh, Margaret, let's start with you. So I I wrote from when I was a kid, but not very seriously, you know, poetry, journal entries. I think I wrote a short story about a squirrel one time that we turned okay. into a book with one of those like Apple 2GS programs where you can make your own book. Right. Um, but I started getting really into fiction in college when I started writing a lot of fan fiction, mostly Harry Potter based. I desperately wanted to bring Sirius Black back through the veil. Really? Okay. <laughs> um, and then I started writing zombie fiction and um, I fell in love with historical fiction quite by accident. And it's what I've been doing ever since almost for about 20 years coming up. Wow. On so what did you think of Pride and Prejudice and Zombies? I loved it. Yeah, you know, that I, I just kinda, seems like it would would fit into everything you love. <laughs> it does. I kind of came to it not expecting a, you know, not expecting a lot as far as, um, you know, really speaking to the historical era because right. we know from historical records there were not any zombie attacks. But um, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I like I like a little bit of playfulness in writing whenever possible, yeah. Yeah. and um, you know, for me that that was one of the books that really got me interested in Jane Austen. I had not read her work before okay. and I read that first and then I read her other books and fell in love. So um, it's hard to not like that book because it was like my Jane Austen gateway book. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. And Suzanne, how did you get started? Um, well, I had tried, I had done, dabbled a little bit in writing when I was much younger. And actually, when I graduated from high school, my English teacher told me that I had great ideas, but I didn't know how to write. Oh. And so <laughs> I, that really struck me. And when yeah. I went to college, the first thing I did was take a forms of writing course, a, you know, a sort of thing for writing essays and stuff. Okay. It was like, oh, that's how you do it. I got it, you know. <laughs> But that aside, um, I was really going to be, I wanted to be an academic in the end, okay. having passed through several other careers on the way. And, um, but that was not on the cards. And so I somehow backed into writing because I was working on a, a scholarly article for uh, about who wrote Handel's Susanna, the libretto for Handel Susanna. Okay. And um, stumbled on this amazing Augustan poet, uh, Elizabeth Tollett. And she had a she had one volume of verse and it had a Handel um, libretto. It had a Susanna libretto in it and a okay. poem praising Handel. And I thought, oh, wow, maybe this is it. Well, it wasn't. But I got fascinated with her and uh, there's this one, she just, all there is about her is a, an entry in the Dictionary of Nat National Biography. You know that, okay. the DNB? Yeah. And um, so I thought, what? And she was so interesting. She grew up living in the Tower of London. Her father was commissioner of the Navy. Her, okay. her godfather was Isaac Newton. Anyway, all this amazing stuff. So I started imagining what her life was like and wrote a fictional autobiography. And it was like, oh, God, this is so much more fun than academic writing. <laughs> <laughs> so then basically that, that's how I started writing historical fiction anyway. Right. Yeah. And I'm interested in, in your views on historical fiction because I was, I was um, you know, I'm, I'm going to turn 50 in just over a month. And I was talking to another book coach who's actually helping me write a book that's set in 1974 we were talking about a genre and you know he's he's very young and he said oh maybe your genre should be historical fiction and I was like it's 1974 like so for you what what is your definition like uh 
So, uh, Margaret, what for you? At what point does historical fiction actually become historical? So, um, I, I'm sure that everyone who loves to re- read World War II books will hate me for saying this, but for me, I'm not interested in anything before 1910. Okay, <laughs> whole, it just right. doesn't it doesn't pique my interest. I don't right. know if that I would necessarily you know have that as a hard and fast line for historical fiction, but I would say, you know. It, it it should be far enough in the past that it's it's not in you know in the lifetime of the author and you know mm-hmm. there there's a certain amount of world building that comes with it that's that's part of the genre and I I feel like first you know if I was going to write a book about the 1980s I was an 80s kid I wouldn't mm-hmm. call that historical fiction because I lived it and I don't have to do any research or world building I'm just going to yes. come to the page and write yeah yeah. And for you, Suzanne, at what, at what point do you think there's a cutoff? Well, I I have a lot of sympathy for what Margaret's saying. Um, on the other hand, World War II is less and less in people. There are fewer and fewer people alive who have that yeah. as a living memory. Mm-hmm. So I get it, you know. Yeah. Um, and I've read some wonderful books set, you know, in that. And and the thing thing is that the archives were suddenly unsealed. So that's where a lot of the information came from. Um, I personally would not want to do that research. I just don't want to be in that era. So for me, you know, I love the 18th century. I've written through all the way through to about 1910 in different books. Okay. Um, And of course, my trilogy, the book that's coming out is medieval. It takes place in the 13th century. So I, too, have seen books in the 70s labeled historical fiction, and I just, I was in college then, for heaven's sake. (laughs) (laughs) It just, yeah, yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, I mean, I I felt, like, attacked when he said, (laughs) he's 74, I mean, I was born in 71, so, you know, 74 (laughs) historical fiction, I was just like, but it, it did make me stop and think, like, you know, is it and should I sell it as as a historical fiction? How do you kind of conduct research if you're going back, you know, hundreds of years, Margaret? For me, um, I, I was an art history major in college. Okay. So I kind of start with that. You know, what do yeah. I recollect from those classes? Um, my favorite periods were ancient, medieval and Renaissance. So any of those three really spoke to me and I, I retained enough of it that it's a little bit easier for me to start with those periods, you know, okay. and decide where to go from there. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'll start with the internet, but honestly, usually my first stop is a library and, okay. you know, looking at the books that they have there. And usually that'll bring me into another direction. Mm. Um, for this, for, for this book, it was just a, a deep and abiding love for this legend of Robin Hood. It's always been like my favorite legend. So I kind of, you know, started mostly with that. But if I'm starting with the history, um, it usually comes from the art historical background, even if the art is not making a big appearance in my book. Okay. And then for you, Suzanne, I mean, you you have a PhD, right? Yes. I have so a you're PhD kind of... in music history. Right. So, okay. Yeah. But you yeah, are pre-programmed and... for research. Yes. But I have to say, I do not disdain the web. And I'll tell okay. you why. Because so much material that used to be locked away in archives is now digitized. And used to be, and I've written about this, used to be that if you wanted to write historical fiction and get access to these things, you had to have the luxury of being able to travel to libraries all over the world. And now you don't, (laughs) because I would say most of the time you can get access to what you need through the web, if not on the web. And... um, and one of the other things that, you know, Margaret may kill me for or somebody else is like <laughs> Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a great place to start, not mm, to finish, but to yeah. start. Because if the article is written by, and a lot of them are written by scholars who have a lot of background, they have a bibliography. So then you look at the bibliography and you can figure out what you need, what you want to yes. read from there. Yeah. Um, but of course I have gazillion books. I mean, I, I buy research books and everything. And um, when, before COVID, I had access to the Smith College libraries, which are, you know, just 
half a mile away from me. Um, oh, wow. It's where I went to undergraduate and did a master's degree. And uh, have fabulous collections there. And so I'm very lucky. <laughs> but um, right. our public library doesn't have that much in the way of historical resources, mm. ours. So yeah. Yeah, I it's think quite difficult. Anything is fair game, really. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. But where do you, where do you, um, I mean, you know, but particularly for you, for you, Margaret, where do you um, sort of verify that what it is that you're reading is is kind of okay? And when obviously I'm conscious you're not using the web quite as much, but do you ever run into um, sort of an issue where you're just you're uncertain if some of the facts that you're reading are are correct? Oh yeah. And I mean, I do use the web. I just don't yeah. always start there. Um, I like to, you know, check with museums when I can. I'm, okay. I'm not afraid to reach out to museum library research folks and curators. And um, I, for my uh, first master's degree, I wrote a, a whaling story and my main character was a Cooper and I've actually kind of brought them back into this other project I'm doing. Okay. But um, I went to, I'm fortunate to live close to Mystic Seaport Museum, which is like a, a living museum for the whaling era in America. Okay. And um, I spent about an hour in the Cooperage just kind of like talking to the museum employee who was working on a, a basket. I'm like, what's that tool do? What's that for? How do you use that? And he was so kind. He just, you know, went through each thing with me. Um, probably they don't get a lot of visitors in February, being that it's mostly an outdoor right. museum. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. I, I try to do that. And um, I also kind of feel like, you know, some things are okay to fictionalize. It is historical yeah. fiction. And I know that this is a point Suzanne and I have talked about before that we both agree on. Um, in, in the Red Fletch, you know, writing about Nottingham Castle and Sherwood, these places are different from how they would have been in the late yes. 12th century. So yeah. I look at what's available and then I kind of let my imagination take over. So, so let's let's talk about about that then. So, so Susanna, oh, at what point do you think it it's okay to kind of let go of the truth and start riffing on it? Well, I think that you have to honor the big things. You know, you can't right. change the dates of the wars and the rains and all that kind of stuff. But it really depends on what kind of a novel you're writing. You yeah. know, mine has completely fictional char characters. Right. And and also it depends on the period because things could be more or less known having to do with that period. Mm. Um, I think that if novelists are too, historical novelists are too intent on being factually accurate, it's, yeah. it deaden it's deadening. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, even... Even writing a biographical historical novel, you have a lot of room because you're actually trying to get into the head of the character and you yeah. can't know for certain what was going on. It's an act of interpretation. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, I think the, uh, the object is to bring the period, the place, the people to life for readers and have them really engaged in the story. It's all about the story. Yes. Yes. I think it's... A it's quite interesting. So here in the UK, um, there's a Netflix show called The Crown. Oh yeah, I know. yeah, yeah. And uh, Prince Harry has been kind of, you know, uh, I think he spoke, might have spoken about it on the uh, on the Oprah, the infamous Oprah interview. Um, but it, yeah, I, I guess for us, it's like I I didn't know the Queen said that, <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of you have to remember that it is somebody it's somebody writing. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so Margaret, have you ever had a reader come back to you and say you got this fact wrong? Um, no, I have had readers come back and say uh, you're info dumping. <laughs> oh, okay. It's like, here's all the research I did about whaling yes. ships. Now I'm going to tell you about every single part, and they're like, your characters <laughs> never set foot on a ship, let alone a whaling ship. How would they know this? And I'm like, oh yeah, they got to fix <laughs> that. Um, so it's just you know. It's, it's mostly that. Oh, actually, an example. Suzanne read my book, and <laughs> this is kind of funny. She said to me, you know, you have her grabbing the withers on the horse. She can't grab the withers. Those are the shoulders. I think you mean the mane of the horse. And right. my lessons in horseback riding were so informal. I basically used to muck out a woman's stall for time riding a horse around her backyard. 
Okay. And she always called that part of the horse's mane the wither. So I just thought that's what it was. I didn't bother right. to look it up because I was like, I've ridden a horse yeah. before. I know this. <laughs> and I came back with that and I, I literally started laughing out loud when I saw her note. <laughs> and then I fixed it. <laughs> So you have kind of preempted one one of my the questions that had occurred to me while while you were talking about research, and that is, how do you kind of resist info dumping, and, and have you kind of developed a knack, like a self editing sort of instinct about it? I would say first drafts almost always include an info dump somewhere, right? Okay. Because you know you're always you're working through what do you actually need to tell the 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 right the reader you know yeah, and yeah. um i've gotten better at not info dumping but i still sudden will be reading over a draft and i'll think oh yeah i need to get rid of that because it's just info dumping yeah. but um yeah so self editing good beta readers who understand historical fiction that's really important. It's people, yeah. readers in your genre, you know, yes. and I'm sure you, you know that Stuart yeah, as, a, yes. as an author yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Somebody doesn't know the conventions of romance and they're reading it and they're, yeah. they're going to give you feedback. That's just not useful. You yes. know? So um, I think it's really a very difficult thing, but you learn how to weave in, the historical details in a way that feels natural, that doesn't yeah. call attention to them, but that then just makes it, just makes the setting believable. Right. right. And then do you, would you, would you ever then use a term, because I'm conscious there might be objects or dances or something that, that would have a specific name that wouldn't mean anything to a reader today. Yes, how, do you, in- how do you manage that? You have to, in the context, you have to make it possible for the reader to get it. Right. You know, because you, you would have to say it's a dance and then you give the name. And then it's even if it's not a dance, they know, they'll get, they'll know enough to right. get it. But okay. um, I was going to say something. I'll, I'll think of it in a minute. But Okay. <laughs> and then um, for you, Margaret, uh, at what point when you're going further and further back, does it start to get... Um, difficult to find information. Are there any kind of black holes in history or like events that have might, might have wiped information out? At what point does, does research get difficult for you? So for me, um, a lot of it would be, I would, you know, I would love to be able to come to Europe and England. It's where most of my stories take place. Come, come. Um, yeah, <laughs> I would love to go. <laughs> um, and just, you know, because I, I think that there's more information to be gathered just by being yeah. in person. You know, like Suzanne talked about how historical fiction you used to have to travel there. And yes. um, I think so much of it is, you know, it can be um, elucidated that way. Hmm. But for me, definitely the further back I go, the more I'm fictionalizing, you know, so I, okay. I have um, a book that I drafted last year that's still marinating uh, and it takes place in the second century. Right now, wow. most of that book is entirely made up. Because, <laughs> you know, it's it, the, the character ends up traveling from Rome abroad. And I'm just, you know, I just kind of like went with it. And okay. we'll have to do massive edits after, right. I, you know, I'm, I'm now diving back into the research for it. I tend to do as little research as possible on the front side now to right. avoid those info dumps but the flip side is that there's a lot of editing work to be done um so i do sometimes run into black holes and you know as long as it isn't something huge like suzanne said you know when a war happened or when you know someone was on the throne i'll i'll generally fictionalize it if a good amount of effort you know over a couple of weeks doesn't yield any answers yeah so yeah you know i was working with a, a group of um or belly dancers, and because uh, I used to do like you know theatre costume way back in another life, and um, so we were doing you know the big Egypt. I don't even know what they're called. You know the big Egyptian. Um, I don't know what are they called. The big sort of collars that go around. Yeah. Some somebody's going to leave a message on this and just yeah, that would be good. I don't know what they're called, and I know a lot about costume. <laughs> right. Okay. So we were trying to. Um, the dancers were like getting really, um, you know, concerned about 
accuracy and all this sort of stuff. And in the end, I said, do you know what we need to do is go and ask children what an Egyptian looks like? Because most people, they only know from like childhood. And if you get those broad brushstrokes, if something is recognizable as being Egyptian, most people will buy it. Yeah. Um, do you find that the readers that interact with you are you're getting different messages depending if they're like a casual reader or if they're like really into their history? You know, I have never had a reader challenge me on my historical information ever. Good. And I would say one of the things that is is really important is the author's note at the back because what readers want to know is what did you make up what's real and i the author's note is a fantastic place to say okay this that i said happened it didn't really happen but okay. i was going with the story yeah. or this person you know didn't really do this or i made this person up because i needed a whatever you, yeah. you can get get away with a lot that way so as long as you're not sort of pretending it's real and I think most people, most people who read historical fiction are reading it because of the story, not because, mm. and it can be a gateway to digging deeper into history, which is awesome. Yeah. But, um, but it's fiction, it's entertainment. It's, that said, I have to tell you, uh, I, I wrote a blog post recently about me, about measurement, medieval measurement of time. Okay. Because when you're writing and you, you automatically, the classic one is, I say, I'll be there in a second. You can't right. say that in the Middle Ages because they didn't measure time in seconds. <laughs> and the clocks that had seconds didn't a appear until the 16th century, I think, was the first clock. Oh, no, that was the first one that showed minutes, I think. Okay. So you have to think of other ways. That's the kind of accuracy that I strive for. You right. know, like, um, or measurement, like it was a thumb's length instead of two inches or something like that. Ah, okay. So, um, so, I mean, why, why write historical fiction? Because, I mean, it sounds like an absolute nightmare if you're having to, I mean, I mean, for me, just in terms of dialogue, historical fiction would, would put me off because you, uh, I mean, is it a case of reading other historical fiction books and trying to get the the syntax and the vernacular right? Well, I'll leave that for Margaret to answer. <laughs> That's an interesting question. It actually comes up in my author's note um, because if I were going to be writing accurately with dialogue, right. my aristocratic characters would be speaking some form of French, and my okay. um, my average strata characters would be speaking middle English. So it, it would be unreadable. Um, and right. in fact, I, I include sections of one of the original Robin Hood ballads in each chapter that I translated from middle English to modern English. Cause wow. even reading that you can't always tell exactly, you know, what's being said unless you've spent a lot of time with Chaucer. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. Um, it, I tried to modernize mine. Mine is, you know, I'm I'm hoping that adult readers will enjoy it, but I'm aiming mostly for YA readers. So, you know, I okay. thought to myself, if I was 17 again and I picked up a book and all the dialogue was in Middle English, <laughs> what would I do? I would probably throw it across the room. <laughs> yes, yes. So well, and it is a little bit more modernized, but, yeah. um, you know, it, it, there there is an effort to not include words that are anachronistic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would say that. I mean, it's dialogue. They have to speak in a way that's believable to a modern reader. Yeah. And, you know, my, um, a lot of my books, most of my books take place in Europe and, and, and not in England. In fact, then I don't have English speaking characters in my okay. books, most of them. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's all a question of even if you go and read uh, contemporary sources, letters, whatever you would never want to write your dialogue the way people used to talk to each other in letters like that. Yeah, it yeah. just, it sounds stilted and artificial and, um, you know, you avoid the obvious anachronisms. Like you don't say, uh, you don't say I'll zip right over <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> or something like that. Or, um, 
you know, or let's rewind. That's another yeah. one that's a yes. really good yes. anachronism. Um, but you just have to, it, you, you write it like you'd write any other book. It's yeah. and, and the thing is that I don't, I, I find the history is what inspires me to write. So I've tried to write contemporary things and I just couldn't because I just would lose uh, interest after okay. a while. Yeah. It, you know, it is interesting. I mean, uh, as, as a book coach, I like to be thorough. Okay. But I like to be kind. Um, you know, I've had some, I've said in other episodes, I've had horrible reviews, some really unpleasant edit experiences. But I was reading, um, I got very, um, we have an expression in the UK called shirty, yeah, sort of no, irritated yeah. and a bit annoyed. Yeah. Um, so I was reading an award-winning book this year and it had flashbacks to the First World War and one of the characters used the term no harm, no foul. And my first instinct was not to look it up, but something was nagging in the back of my head. And it turned out that wasn't coined till, I don't know, 50s, 60s, something like that. And, and it's interesting, like what you say, even the span of 40 years, an expression can just, can, just not exist. Also, but there's a flip side to that. Sometimes I think I read something and I think that word is wrong. It's, and then I go and look it up and it's like, no, no, it was being used then really? already, you know. And uh, one of the one was, I think, gifting something. Okay. That has been in use since way, way back. And right. whereas we tend to think of it as somebody's decided to do that instead of giving. But no, it's got a very different connotation. Because giving, so you can give somebody anything. I'll give you a ride, <laughs> you know. Yes. But gifting something gives it more kind of importance, or yeah. it's it's more of a gesture. Yeah. I still don't um, like to use the word though. <laughs> no, and I was gonna I was gonna ask about that. Do you? Um, uh, what kind of things snap you out as as historical fiction readers? as well as writers, um, what kind of things will snap you out of a book that you think maybe historical fiction writers could either avoid or just lean back on? I think for me, it, it comes down to whether I can tell something is inaccurate by mistake or by the author's intent. Right. You know, so it's if, if it's an act of storytelling and it's done... Well, you know, I feel like um, after reading enough historical fiction, you can tell when the author is breaking the rules on purpose. Okay. And if not, there is always the author's note. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but uh, if it's done on purpose for craft reasons, oftentimes I'll overlook it or, you know, try not to let it bother me. But a single word wouldn't be enough usually to kick me out. I might just find it fascinating to look into the etymology of it. Okay. But, um, you know, if someone has an event happening at the completely wrong time, you know, I'm, I'm more gentle with television shows than I am with books. Okay. <laughs> a lot of people are, you know, look at the tutors, nothing in that show mm. happened at an accurate timeline. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, I, I think I try to be a little bit, um, to not get kicked out by anachronisms. Usually what will kick me out is if there's um, an issue with the storytelling itself. Yeah. 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 I, I tend to agree. Although if there's something really anachronistic that I know a lot about it, it really, you know, for instance, a musical reference that, that will totally get me out of it because right. I know a whole lot about it. Well, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say with your, your background and your study. Yeah. Um, then then I feel as though if somebody said something about a musical thing and I feel like they just haven't bothered to do the research because they've yeah. assumed nobody will notice. <laughs> <laughs> do you think many readers do sort of go into it, not looking for holes, but I mean, people want a story. They want to be entertained. Do you think the majority of historical fiction readers are kind of that that bothered about accuracy? No. I don't think so. 
No. Margaret. No, I, I agree with you, Suzanne. I, I don't think they are. Um, because, I mean, some of the historical fiction books that have sold particularly well over the years, you know, I read them and I said, okay, well, that's not accurate. And the other piece too, is we're learning new things about history all the time. Yeah. So sometimes we, you know, it's very easy to come to a book and apply presentism to it where we say, oh, well, this, we know this isn't how it was, but was that known when the book was written or when the person, mm -hmm. you know, was researching for it? Maybe not. Um, and it could just be a difference of opinion. You know, history is written by the victors. So, you know, yes. I, I, I find a lot of times if it's, if it's something that's still being studied or um, something that we have very one-sided records about. Yeah. I don't think that tends to bother people too much because I think people like to see the other story, you know, yes. there, there's all those like, well, look at wicked, you know, right. <laughs> that's, that's the other story of, you know, of the, of the wicked witch. So it's, yeah. you know, people are very interested in that sort of thing. Um, so I don't, I don't think it bothers the average reader. I, I do know, um, I, I have heard among other historical fiction writers, I think it can bother them more because they're in it, right. they're in the genre, yeah. and they're looking for those things in their own work. So it's easy to kind of be bothered by it in the work of others. Okay. So. Another thing you can think get... the, Sorry. The, Go the ahead. people who are bothered by it are the ones who, who are... Um, who are writing for the historical ag think, thinking that that's the important thing is to be historically right. accurate yeah. when it's not the story is the important thing. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Are there any aspects? Um, I guess what I'm thinking about is I follow um, Bernadette Banner on YouTube. Um, so her whole thing is around his um, costume, like historical accuracy of costume and uh, she's very engaging, very funny, a um, little bit eccentric. She lives in New York, but her hair, I mean, she looks like Mary Poppins most of the time. And um, yeah, Can you put that in the chat? I think I want to go follow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, um, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll put it in the show notes, but I will okay. also um, email you separately. Uh, she's amazing. She's like just over 1.1 million uh, followers wow. now. She's wow. really built because it's just so engaging. Yeah. But what she will do is she will run through um, a movie and she will talk about how accurate the costumes are. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find that there are aspects that are easier to write about? Because obviously costume in a movie, you can see it. Mm -hmm. So are there kind of aspects that you find that easier to write about than others? Because, uh, you, because you're not going to be, you know, explaining how a course it's made necessarily. No, but uh, you know, that's another one of my bugaboos. <laughs> I used to buy and sell vintage clothing and textiles. And right. um, so I've studied a lot about construction and stuff like that. And okay. um, so I take great care to make sure that the the clothing and the way the way people put them on, what layers they wear and stuff like that are cor yeah. is correct in my books. Um, I think you can write a historical novel without being that specific yeah. without, you know, yeah. by just saying she put on her dress, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Even though it was a bodice and a, and a, a petticoat. You know? yeah. <laughs> so um, I think what happens, I think it's easy to tell when you're reading a historical novel, if the writer has done her due diligence, who has, yeah. has, the, has really embraced, creating this world, even, even if there were things that she couldn't figure out or couldn't discover, I think yeah. it's clear. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. For me, I, I really enjoy writing about architecture, okay. um, you know, and place settings and also um, weapons. I used to teach martial arts. So like the weapon, <laughs> they just interest me. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah. I, I like I like that stuff to be correct in my own work. Um, right. And sometimes it makes me laugh, you know, like um, people always think that swords that people used in the medieval era were so heavy and they weren't very heavy. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of fun to play with that. And, yeah. you know, um, 
have a character think it's going to be heavy before they pick it up. And then they're like, oh, this actually isn't <laughs> that bad. You know? uh, On the other hand, the armor they wore was really yes, heavy. That was, yes. that was very, very heavy. <laughs> well, the thing but, is, if the, if the weapons were heavy, I mean, you'd, I mean, you, you wouldn't stand a chance, would you? Yet. You're just about strong enough to walk in your armor. Now you have to. Yeah, I mean, pick up... falling off a horse with you in full armor is not a pretty sight. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's interesting, you know, when, when I talk to writers, they're never just writers, you know, like, you know, Suzanne, you've like, you're into your music and like costume and that kind of stuff. And, and then Margaret, you know, you've been doing martial arts and, and, art and all that kind of thing so you know uh margaret coming to you first i think all authors get to that point when they're writing a novel thinking why am i doing this like my life is difficult i'm trying to write i don't know 80 well let's say a minimum of eighty thousand words i'm assuming historical fiction is longer but um you know i'm trying to write this novel um you know, why am I doing it? It's a complete nightmare. And that's contemporary. Do you ever have that that moment, Margaret, where you think, why did I pick historical fiction? Oh, yeah, I do. Definitely. I mean, my draw to historical fiction is mostly because I myself have always felt like an anachronism. Right. <laughs> I, I have to admit when COVID started and there were fewer cars, not because people were sick, but people were afraid to go out. I was kind of like, this right. is nice. Where are the horses and buggies? <laughs> so for me, part of it is the joy of stepping into that world. But I think that this is common of writing any book. You know, there's just yeah. these times when it's kind of like, I've made a huge mistake. Why am I even doing this? Yeah. I, you know, and it's a little bit imposter syndrome. It's a little bit, you know, I think when, when you're writing or when you're heavily revising, you're just so in the weeds with it that it can be really difficult to step back and look at the big picture and remember what this is about or why you're drawn to it. Um, I was, I was getting my MFA, one of the faculty members, Richard Carey, he, he taught a revision workshop and he gave out this list that had like, you know, the steps you go through when you revise. And it started out, you know, like, this is a good book. I'm happy with it. And then it, it, spiraled down to like this is the worst book ever i should never have even been born (laughs) it kind of like works its way back to being okay and um i think i've been through that downward spiral with every single project no matter how long or short it is you know even like a flash fiction story a 100 word story i'm like what is this (laughs) this is not worth the half sheet of paper it's written on um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I find that short much harder than long. Oh, yeah. It's like poetry. Yeah. Every word yeah. you know has yeah. to has to carry weight. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think it's it's a common part of the creative process. Um and I think it extends beyond writing to all creativity. You know, yeah. when I was learning to bake bread, the first one I burnt, I was like, I should never do this. This is awful. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then I just kept trying and it got a little better. So right. I, I think it's very common. So so Historical fiction aside, so my the very first episode um, of this was um, we were talking about um, emotional resilience and bravery. So, f- historical f- fact aside, having to do all that research, how do you push through? You know, when when writing gets tough for you, when you've got imposter syndrome and all of that going on, it's the reason I'm in this lifetime. It it is the driving force for me. It's it's right. why I was put where I am, and you know, for a long time, those twenty years I mentioned that I've been <laughs> almost twenty years that I've been writing historical fiction. Imposter syndrome was winning for all of that, and okay. my method was to say, okay, this isn't ready yet. I'm going to rewrite it from scratch. I'm going right. to rewrite it from scratch, and I did yeah. that with so many books. And then um, last year, actually going through the book coaching training with Author Accelerator. I said to myself, okay, that's clearly what's going on. This is my method yeah. of procrastination enough. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to announce a date for, for a book to come out and I'm going to yes. work toward it. And um, that that to me has unlocked so many things. You know, I still have the imposter syndrome. I don't think it ever goes away. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, but just learning how to deal with it and be like, okay, yeah, it's there. And there are going to be people who don't like what I write. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> You know, there are going to be people maybe who do like it. So it's worth a shot. 
<laughs> and Suzanne, how about you? How do you how do you keep going when the going gets tough? I find writing first drafts really hard, really hard. And um, but I, how I keep going is I keep in mind the story I want to tell. I just keep it there, you know. Yeah. She's got to get to this place at some point. And sometimes it's going to take me a long time to get her there, so to speak. And um, I'm not good at saying, oh, I can write a lousy first draft. I don't like to do that. I tend to self-edit as I go. And I okay. go back and I read what I did before. Yeah. And there, there are writers who are the exact opposite, who just spew it all out on the page and then fix it. I can't quite do that. Hmm. So it takes me a long time to write a draft. Yeah. But then once I get to the editing part and I see where the awful things are, here's the difference. When I was performing, when I was, you know, you, you know, as a performer, you right. do something and it's there. You can't change it once it's been put out into the world. Yes. Right. And, but writing was so freeing for me because it's like, okay, I can fix this. I don't have to show it to anybody until I'm ready to, to do that, yeah. you know? And um, so the editing process kind of helps me a lot with that whole, and once I've got that, once I've managed to get through a, a first draft, I don't find it difficult to go back and edit. I don't, I don't ever sort of feel like I get stuck. Mm -hmm. And if I do, like Margaret, I have, we have those tools from the book coaching, which I actually use. And, they're difficult and they can be painful, but they're so useful. You know, yes, yes. I have done inside outlines for revisions and okay. so revealing. Yes. So revealing. And, and I was going to ask how, how being book coaches has kind of informed your writing. And Suzanne, you've already mentioned the, the inside outline. Mm -hmm. I'm working with a book coach who's, who's um, also in training and, um, I had a short story, which was a chapter basically taken out of my latest novel. And I was going to release it <clears throat> just as a 4,000 word short story because it was a story within a story. And I'm now working on making it, you know, a full length novel <laughs> and going through the inside outline. And just for people who are either listening or watching Suzanne, I'm going to let you explain what the inside outline is because I would struggle. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, just briefly, an inside outline is not really an outline. It's a way of listing all of the, se the important scenes in your book along with what they mean to the protagonist yeah. in a way that has a cause and effect relationship. Yes. And what that does is it exposes where there's a scene that doesn't belong there because it's not related by cause and effect to something yeah. that came before or where things are slightly out of order, or where you need to add something because the cause and effect isn't clear from what you've put down. Yeah. And it's it it takes you off the page. So yeah. it makes you not write. <laughs> it makes yeah. you think of the structure of what's actually going on. And I think that's really one of the most magical things about the whole book coaching process. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And then uh Margaret, for you, what what how has being a book coach sort of flipped back and informed your writing? So for me, writing, characterization and description were always what I felt most comfortable with. And okay. plotting has always been my difficulty. My initial plots tend to be like bombastic and like totally overblown. And, you know, <laughs> book coaching and learning how to become a book coach really taught me yeah. how to incorporate the emotion that you know the, the internal journey that the character is traveling into yeah. the external so that i don't my initial plots don't need to be these crazy bombastic things that sometimes yeah. don't make sense or are overdone and you know um cliched and stuff like that so it you know working with the inside outline working um to always you know keep the characters why and their journey in the forefront of the mind instead of having it kind of serve the plot, you know, having it the other way around. Yeah. It's really, really helped me. And it's, um, it's given me confidence too, that, you know, like I said, imposter syndrome is something that rears its ugly head with me a lot. And it's just, I, I can almost kind of like 
hear an imaginary book coach in the back of my head going like, <laughs> just do the work. <laughs> if you do it. your best. Yes, absolutely. Best, you know, like <laughs> you can't do any better than that. So, yeah, um, yeah. And also, you know, for me to have that little voice pushing me to like put work out into the world somehow mm. is really helpful because otherwise I'll just sit and keep rewriting it and no one will would find it until I someday passed away and people find like my journals and my Google Drive access. Yeah. That is all of these yeah. stories. And and I think I think there is something in there about um I mean certainly what I've noticed is I, I guess I was I was I was like you Margaret, I would set a date and go, okay, that is the date that this book will come out because otherwise, you know, if you are self-publishing, you don't have an external date, then like you say, you can just tinker and tinker and tinker. And even now I've gone back, I've read something in a review and somebody said, I didn't know who said that, that particular line. I was like, okay, yeah, I can go back and fix it. Whereas sometimes if you're traditionally published, I mean, that that's it. I mean, that, that ship has sailed. But what I've always said, I mean, I've been, a development a developmental editor since 2014 and for me the inside outline um and there is a book coming out about it it's called blueprint for a book uh, by jenny nash um and there i will be doing a video a review of that very soon but um i've always said to writers that story is the intersection of plot and character and I think what the inside outline does is it it not forces you, but it really makes you think about what's just happened, what that character is thinking about it, and how that drives them into their next decision or action. Mm-hmm. And like Suzanne says, it gives it meaning and and energy and logic. Which well, I get is just what- as an example, the inside outline for my book that's coming out on uh, September twenty first. I started doing it, and I realized that I had to make somebody else, I had to add a point of view character. Yeah. That it wasn't going to work unless I could yes. have that character's point of view. Yes. So that's a beautiful segue into your joint book launches. Uh, so Suzanne, let me, let's me let talk about Voices in the Mist. Um, Voices in the Mist is the third volume of a trilogy that, I started writing in 2004, I think, um, and it's it takes place in the 13th century in Languedoc, and this is something that arose directly out of my um, studies, my graduate studies. I became face- fascinated with the uh, female troubadours that they had there. It was okay. the only place in Europe in the Middle Ages that had a female troubadour tradition called Troberitz, and and they had their own language, their own culture. They were not part of France until, I think, the 15th century or thereabouts. Um, okay. And they were, you know, anyhow. And then that 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 culture was basically eradicated in the Albigensian Crusades. And so that totally fascinated me. And I wrote the first two volumes, what became the first two volumes, as one book supposedly as my option book for my first novel with, right. with Touchstone. And um, my editor said, it's great, but nobody's ever heard of the Albigensian Crusades. There's no way I could sell this. <laughs> so anyway, it sat, it sat, it sat. And I finally went back to it and decided that I cared about it too much. I wanted it to come out into the world. And um, this is one where I did travel to the region and it's, that was so amazing because I yes. climbed up all of these pogs, they're called, and to the ruined Cathar castles and uh, it, the atmospheric thing. And what, what you got from that was so intense. Yeah. Um, but I had the luxury of being able to do that at the time, time-wise. But um, it's that's I don't know what else to say at this point, but <laughs> it's just the, the final volume of that trilogy, and it hopefully ties everything up. Although the final volume is kind of a prequel, okay, like a, almost like a bookend, sort of. A little bit, yeah, yeah. Okay. It starts before and then ends at the at, after. There's, yeah, sort of. Have you written but, a series of books before, like trilogies? Or? No, and I will never do it again. <laughs> Why? 
it's hard. I mean, yep. really, because you have to <laughs> you have to have something that goes across so many different things. And and I struggled so with this last book. I have to confess, because um, the first two together come to a very natural end at a very big event, and. But I knew I wanted to, There, I wasn't finished with the time period and with the story, right. and I wanted to sort of fill things in. So it was really, it was hard to do that in a way and to do it so that, um, so that the people who'd read all of it would feel a sense of closure at the end. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, a trilogy is different from a series because a series has, each book has its own self-contained story. Yeah. The trilogy has to work as a unit. So yeah. anyway, I, I feel no <laughs> desire or need to write another trilogy. <laughs> Do you know? So so yeah, I mean, I, I it was the biggest mistake I ever made writing a trilogy because because I know I've said this again and it, but it bears repeating. I'd written one book and it was supposed to stand alone. I was being interviewed by the BBC and they said, "What are you writing next?" And before I realised, I said the sequel, and then the sequel <laughs> ended on a cliffhanger with a huge wave wiping out London. <laughs> and now I don't know what to write for the trilogy. Like, I don't know what to write for the third book. So it's certainly something I that feel, I was... I feel you. I actually, <laughs> I can really understand that. Totally. I was like, why? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. for you, though, is it, is it, because I, I miss my characters. I mean, I, I really do. I feel not separation anxiety, but, but you know, I, I do miss them and I keep thinking about them and think, how could I bring them back in another book? Not a sequel, but just have them on like the periphery. Um, so although you kind of regretted writing a trilogy, how, how are you feeling about this last book coming out? I am at peace with it. You are. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. Because actually the characters in the first two books, it's the minor characters who are who are in the the sort of evil characters who come back in this book. The okay. protagonists are different. So um yeah. That thing about loving your characters, I have a series uh, of of YA historical mysteries okay. about a young Viennese violinist. And I love her so much. I'm going to keep writing books for her. Oh, good. So I really get that. But they don't have to be sequential in terms of, you know, the the stories linking. Yes, yes, yes. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm, I'm happy to do spin-offs, <laughs> but I would never do a direct sequel. Never, never, never. Because you just have to plan them so well. Yeah, and I know historical novelist um, Tracy... Oh God, I'm going to be, embarrass myself by not remembering her name, which is terrible. Um, but I am, I'm older than you are, Stuart, just <laughs> letting you know. <laughs> anyway, you, must moisturize. Um, she, you have to keep, you have to keep a, a separate series arc. You have to have a oh, whole yeah. idea for your series if you're using the same characters. And yeah. that's a, that's a lot of work. Some people do it and really enjoy it, but it is. A there's a, I think there's a way of writing a series if your character doesn't change. Um, so, for example, I, I haven't read the books, but I've seen the James Bond movies. I mean, yes. to me, certainly the older James Bond, not the Daniel Craig, like he he doesn't change. You know what you're getting with 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 him, and to a certain extent, Indiana Jones or somebody like that. I think it's maybe easier to write a series where your protagonist doesn't really sort of change by the end of the book, and maybe yeah. series where they have you know thrillers and things like that. Um. Margaret, have you have you written a series? So the Red Fletch is book one of a trilogy. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, are you are you listening with horror? Because we're all saying, don't do it. No, no, I actually really um, enjoy it. And um, a future series I'm going to write, I'm actually taking the the manuscript I wrote and breaking it into three. So it okay. started as one, and I'm breaking it up. So. I'm hoping that this might be a way to like keep that <laughs> overarching <laughs> unity, you know, just like, because um, unlike, uh, unlike Suzanne, I, I like drafting more than I like okay. editing and I don't mind writing a really horrible first draft. So right. 
to me, the idea of like blasting through in 70 to 80,000 words, a story that will ultimately take three to four times that um, as a first draft doesn't, doesn't bother me. Um, but yeah, this book, uh, the red Fletch is number one in the heroes okay. of Sherwood series. Um, and I have it planned as a trilogy, but I understand what you're saying. I, I adore my main character. I adore writing my main character so much. Yes. That I might either write like spinoffs or, you know, later ones, um, or maybe even a prequel down the road. Yes. Who yes. knows? Um, she's her head is just a lot of fun to be in. Yeah. Um and uh, you know, I don't know if I'll be ready to completely give her up after three, but we'll see. <laughs> I might need a break. <laughs> Let, let her rest. She'll have done a lot of work by then. So. <laughs> so you're having a joint book launch, which I just think is just the most adorable thing. What 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 do you have planned? Well, <laughs> well, we have we have a we have a, a host. We have someone who's going to be interviewing us and um, asking questions, and I think that. It's just so much more interesting when you have two different authors talking about their books than it is yeah. one person maybe doing a reading or whatever. I don't know. We maybe we'll read something from our books. I don't even know whether we'll do that. Our plan is for it to be just kind of fun and for people to come and yeah. enjoy talking about books and stories and everything. And what's really fun is both Margaret and I and the woman who's and Lorraine Norwood um, are book coaches. So, ah, so we have that okay. whole sort of book coaching author accelerator thing going, which yeah, is yeah. really fun. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I love hanging out with writers. Mm-hmm. I'm really lo- loving to um, learning to love to hang out with book coaches. I mean, we just, it's really interesting to see the, the similarities of the way that we, we think and the way the approach to our own writing has, has, has kind of, has kind of changed. What, um, advice would you give to people who are thinking about getting into historical fiction because for me it feels like quite a daunting genre to get into well you want to go margaret sure um i mean i think with any genre the advice of read a lot in the genre is really good advice and just to kind of see how how books in that genre are put together how they work i think that Historical fiction has a lot in common with fantasy and sci-fi and other speculative fiction because of the world okay. building. So yeah. it can be a nice way to bridge if people who already are comfortable writing in those genres want to experiment with historical fiction as well. Um, I would also say um, get comfortable doing research because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whether whether you do it on the front side or you're doing it in revision, like like I you know like to focus most of mine, you know libraries, the internet, museums. Um, I watch a lot of documentaries. I enjoy those, the great courses, you know, whatever kind of is your, um, whatever suits your mode of learning, get really used to being in that a lot and just always be curious. I think that's, that's one of the keys. Um, And I would say, oh, anything that, that, writers can do to experience things as close as they did in the past as possible. I once wrote five pages with quill and ink by candlelight. And after five pages, my hand was cramping. My eyes were tired. <laughs> I, was like, I don't know how people did this in the past, but it, it was really nice to kind of like go into that mode and connect with how it felt to work with those tools, you know, because, they didn't have a computer and LED lights and all of that stuff. Yeah, all this good stuff, yeah. I I also would say don't just decide to set a story in a previous time period. Okay. You have to really, really be into that time period and have a really good reason for doing yeah, it, you know. Because yeah. um, you're going to spend a lot of time there, basically. So you have to really want to you know, there has to be something about it that's drawing you to it. That's what I would say. Yeah. And um, and I, speaking to what Margaret said about quill and ink and all that stuff, I have worked with um, Hawks, and because I'm I have a book in the background that 
deals with mid- in a medieval book that about falconry with okay. a female falconer and stuff. And I just discovered that down the road from me is a fencing academy. And Ooh. I think I'm going to take some fencing lessons because one of the characters in my in my books uh, with Teresa, my violinist, is um, a fa- is a historical character who was like the best swordsman in, in of his age, of black violinist and swordsman. And I think I want Teresa to have to learn how to fence. Yeah. And so I'm going to go and do some fencing lessons. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds a lot you, know, more you can fun imagine than... how it would be, but I don't think until you actually physically try it yes. that you would really know. Yeah. And that's I mean, the thing about the music too, because yeah. I, you know, I've I've done that. And so that's what I try to put in the music is the understanding, Gross. the feeling, the emotional feeling of what it's yeah. like to play. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess you can't really what learn fencing from watching Errol Flynn running up and down a polystyrene. Yeah. staircase and you can minutes. learn a lot you can learn a lot by researching but it's different if you have the opportunity and it's not too difficult to actually physically do something like you know margaret anybody could sit there by candlelight and write on whatever yeah you know so and then also to be prepared to take the experiences that you've had and find ways to weave them in um I got thrown off of a horse when I was riding, and it's it's gonna make it into a story sometime because it hurt a lot. <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> um, so you know, just like taking things that um, writers themselves have experienced and trying to find a way to put a historical understanding or historical yeah. spin to it, as you know, suits their their time period. Do, do, One thing, that, a, speaking a of time. horses, I'd love to ride side saddle. And what that was like, I've never done it though. Yeah, That's yeah. something that I would love to do before I write another novel that involves women riding side saddle. <laughs> do they do they do that in the US? Because I know you've got your sort of Western horse riding oh, is very different, totally to, very different. different to British. Oh, no, but and that's not all over the US at all. In the Northeast, it's all English. It's all hunt seat and everything. Uh, yeah, okay. that West is west (laughs) all right okay it's just that i used to um i used to edit uh western horse uk magazine and it's interesting how many people in the in the uk are interested in riding the way they think everybody in the us rides yeah yeah i know but they don't i i didn't i used to i used to do (laughs) jumping and dressage and all that kind of stuff you know i mean all english saddle for sure good but yeah. I wonder where we can find you some side saddling to be doing. If you ever come, if you ever come to the UK, I've got horsey yeah. friends. Yeah. So we'll yeah. so we'll do that. Um the other thing I was going to say about the, about the UK is and I don't know why I'm even mentioning this, but um I'm very lucky to live in a part of the UK that has a lot of Georgian um houses. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I'm I'm determined that I am going to live one day in a Georgian house, but I went to view a house um, locally. It's called Bailiff's House, um, and it is exactly what it was. It was the house that the bailiff um, lived in. But what we find in the UK is because they were already established paths, now there are roads. So it's actually quite difficult to find a Georgian house that isn't on a road, Yeah, yeah. which is kind of not not what you want at all. And it, I, ideal I, real estate, mm. yeah. Oh, well, how do you... Same in New England. A lot yeah. of places in New England, there are a lot of like homes from the 1600s that are right on the road, maybe like 10 yeah. feet from the road. Yeah. And you know that that's not, you know, yeah. I mean, you, you, like our zoning standards, they would never let anyone build a house that close to the road these days. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. You <laughs> but know it's, what? It's we fell in love with this one Georgian house. Oh, it was just, it was just so beautiful. But if you stood in the garden, you could hear the motorway. Yeah. And it's like no, you ruined it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any challenges in researching sort of localities or geography? I have an amazing thing here, which I'm actually going to show you. This is a map of Paris from the, uh, I think, in the 17th century down wow. to the level of houses and things. It's really incredible. Oh, it's goodness, like massive. Pornography. Yes. <laughs> and I, I got it. It exists on the web. You can get really? the high definitions files off the web 
and I forget what it's called, and maybe I'll tell you afterwards, but I got it, and I had it printed out, and that is like, that helped me so much in my books that are set in Paris, because I can see, I go and look at Google Maps, and I, and I map the route from here to here, from one place to another, okay. and I set the pace as, um, for if it's a carriage, I put it as a bicycle pace, okay. and then I go and look at that map and see what what roads were already there and what okay. roads weren't and what what route they would have to have taken to get from a to z and how long it would take thank you google maps because they have that walking <laughs> and 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 cycling yeah. speed but yeah sorry yeah it's that's it is a challenge can you send me so you can get that map on the yes, internet. and there's a name for it, and you just and I just have to go and look for it. I'll look for the file, and I'll, I'll send you what that is because it's yeah, just. You know, when we're done, I'd love to put it in the show notes because people are going to be intrigued. Yeah. I think yeah. to read that, but you don't find stuff like that very often. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm finding I, I'm finding it difficult to find a map of Cyprus in 1974 of the mm-hmm. particular city that I'm trying to find. The only ones I yep. can find are in Turkey. They are in Turkish because Turkey invaded. Um, the northern part of Cyprus in 1974, where this particular city is. So I'm finding it very hard just to get one from the 70s. But if you're finding it hard, your readers will too. Yeah. So that means you have a little bit more latitude to like make your best guess. Yeah. But all my Greek Cypriot family who were oh, evacuated well, yeah. from our city. Well, I'm then like, can I'm you like, ask them? Why don't you have no maps? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so. it's just it's just one of those things. Okay, so remind me again of your actual book launch dates because your your books are coming out at slightly different times, aren't they? Although you're having a joint launch. So Margaret, The Red Fletch. Yes, that comes out on Saturday, September 18th. Okay. Um, and I, I am actually, I'm doing two launch events. I'm doing um, a local one for friends and family with some okay. funny medieval hats. And Great. then with <laughs> Suzanne on the 21st. <laughs> Yeah. So your joint launch is that in person or online? That's it's Zoom. Zoom. We're yeah. doing it over Zoom. Yeah. So we okay. have it set up through Eventbrite. So the tickets are free, but because Zoom limits how many people you can have, we you know seating is technically limited. Though it's a high, it's a pretty high limit. We can have okay. people on there. All right, fantastic. Send me send me links to all of that as soon as you've got them established, and I'll make sure they're in the show notes. I'll probably put them oh, on my you. website. All yeah. those kind of things. Yeah, because I mean, I'd certainly like to be there to support you. It'd be awesome. Um, and then Suzanne, Voices in the Mist. That's the 21st. That's that's Perfect. why we decided to do this. So I was like, your book's coming out on the 18th. Mine's on the 21st. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> and that totally blew my mind when you asked that. I was like dancing around the house that day. <laughs> that's <laughs> perfect. And then, and then is it difficult organizing a launch? I mean, I've never done a book launch. Um I just assumed it was well, especially in COVID, six people getting drunk in your garden. What what are you are you like That sounds like fun actually? <laughs> so what what are you are you planning sort of giveaways, all that kind of thing? Yeah, we're gonna do a giveaway, um an interview, we're gonna open things up to like public Q and A. Um and we like we, we might read from our books. Um, right. We have it scheduled out for an hour, but if people are interested in sticking around, both of us have said that you know we're fine hanging out later than that. Right. And we're going to record it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that we can share it, you know, for anybody who wasn't available that evening and would like to take part in the fun. Um, but I think to to participate in the giveaway and to ask live questions, obviously, you know, have to be there. Yeah. Or the event. <laughs> well, listen, yeah. I know we've been talking about historical fiction, but I could quite happily continue talking to both of you till the end of time. Yeah. So uh, like thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I know you're both busy women and trying to get you together at the same time. All of these things are always a bit of a challenge, but um, I really appreciate you taking time out to talk to me today. Um, it's been oh, absolutely thank fascinating. You, and Thank you so much, Stuart. It was really awesome. You're yeah, very welcome. And it's always lovely that. to talk to book coaches. And I will see you in some book coach, uh, you know, catch ups over coffee and all of that yeah. kind of stuff soon. Yeah. But for now, thank you so much. And good luck with your book launches. Thank you. Yeah.